Well, hey everybody, welcome back again to the channel. This is going to be an introduction to my new Pitts S1D. And you can see here, I have on my fancy Pitts S1D t-shirt for this video. So I wanna introduce you to this airplane. I wanna tell you a little bit about its history and a little bit about the airplane itself. I will try to make that as unboring as possible by including lots of uh, B-roll. Now that's hard to do and it uh, takes time to edit. So if you don't mind, go ahead and give the video a thumbs up. I'd really appreciate it. And before we get started, I want to give you my disclaimer right away. I am very new to the world of Pitts biplanes and aerobatics. So everything I'm going to tell you in this video, I think is true according to my understanding. If I'm wrong and you know better, please leave a comment below and let us know because it will educate me and everybody else who watches this video. So with that said, let's get started. Now, one of the nice things about this 1965 Pitts is that it has all of the original logs. There are three log books here, and I found some interesting things in here I thought I'd share with you. All right, if we open up log book number one, we can see that this airplane was built by C.W. Walker. And on the next page here, it shows a, a Pitts special, serial number one. And I guess the serial number, you can kind of make that anything you want. Uh, he put it as one. The date of manufacture is September 28th, 1965. The other thing we'll notice, it was originally built with a Lycoming O290. On the next page here, he just lists in the logbook here all the materials that were used as far as what size tubing for the fuselage. And on this page, we see that the very first flight was on September 29th, 1965 at 5.08 p.m., 20 minute flight. Now what's interesting, and I don't know if they did this back in the day, but this is the aircraft log, but he also used this to log all of his flights. So he kind of used this as his personal log book. So all of his flights are listed in this log book. So pretty much the rest of this log book is basically his personal log book of all the flights and uh, times that he did in this airplane. We're looking in log book two now, and what's interesting is in March of 69, there's an entry here that's kind of hard to read, but it says, aircraft fuselage replaced because of unairworthy welds found in original. So I guess uh, he wasn't too good of a welder, so they had to replace the fuselage. Now I won't go over every little detail in these log books, but just some of the interesting things. Here's an entry here uh, from October of 72, the wings, Wings were removed from aircraft and all components inspected, airplane reassembled and re-rigged as per designer specifications, blah, blah, blah. And one of the things that I noticed in these logbooks is this airplane has been built a number of times. The fuselage has been replaced, I think, three times, and uh, the wings have been recovered a number of times. And I think later on we'll see that the latest rebuild was in 1995. Here's an entry here where it says repairs completed on tip. I think they had a ground loop I read somewhere in there. Uh, it was recovered in grade A through silver, entire aircraft repainted. So there's one of the rebuilds. <laughs> and on this page here, we have the uh, first flight after that uh, rebuild. A few pages later in the same logbook, this is in 1976, the fuselage disassembled to frame, sandblasted and checked to pits uh, something. But anyway, it was, it was taken apart, rebuilt again. In the third and final log book in 1983, it says removed O290 engine and installed O360 engine. So here's where we put in the new engine. Here's an entry here in 1989, where if you read that, pretty much the entire airplane was taken apart and reassembled again. Here the aircraft was sold in 1989 to Lee Kluger, looks like, in Georgia. This page here just indicates that the airplane was taken apart again and reassembled. And then uh, here it was sold again in 89 to Lou Furlong, Furlong. And on this page here, I won't read it, but it's just almost everything in the airplane has been replaced. And it's, this is kind of a normal theme with this airplane. It's a number of times they've gone through and just replaced almost everything in the airplane. In fact, everything in that airplane that's in there now is not what was originally uh, built. Here's a new weight and balance info in here. And then the other page I have here is 
disassembled aircraft for recover and stripped and painted. This is a 1995 and this is the latest one where they've completely disassembled the airplane and uh, recovered it and painted it. So this was the last rebuild in 1995. Well, I thought what I would do next is take you around this airplane and show you some of its features and then also show you how it differs from my E-Model pits. And if you don't know about my E-Model pits, I have a couple other videos on this channel uh, explaining my story with that pits that you can check out later. But for now, let's take a look at this airplane and compare it to the other one. Starting up front here, this airplane has a metal Sensnik fixed pitch prop. And I do not know the pitch of this particular propeller. If we look in the original logbook, it does list a Sensnik 61 inch pitch propeller, but uh, I do not know if that is the one that's currently installed on the airplane. Moving up to the engine compartment, we see that it is an IO360, even though the logbook just said an O360. Obviously, as you can imagine, it has the Kristen inverted oil system. And what's pretty cool about this airplane is it has cabin heat. And they've put the on off selector for cabin heat up here in the engine compartment. And it's also different, it's opposite than what it says. It says pull for cabin heat, and actually when you pull it, it's off, and when you push it, it's on. So it's either on and off, you can't control it from the cockpit. So in the summertime it's off, in the wintertime it will be on. This airplane does have the bungee style landing gear. And we'll see on my E-Model pits that it does have the spring steel gear. And I don't know which one is better as far as flying. Obviously with this gear, you don't have the bungees to replace. It's kind of a maintenance free gear. One other thing that's different on my D-Model as opposed to the E-Model is I have two windows on the side. Now you might think that helps for landing and it really doesn't because the eyes are up top here looking out. I'm told that these are a little more useful when you're in the aerobatic box, but as far as uh, I'm concerned right now with my limited experience, I don't really use them, although they're nice to have. You will notice there are no side windows on the E-Model. On the left wing, it has a standard long pitot tube. I'm not really sure why they're so long on a pits, but that seems to be standard from what I've seen. And on the, the eye strut here, on the left wing. Most of you guys probably know what this is, but if you don't, it's not an antenna. It is used for aerobatics. So if the airplane was going completely vertical, this bar right here would line up with the horizon. And this bar right here that you can barely see is straight and level. And then of course you have your 45s for your 45 degree up and down lines. This little bar right here has an airfoil shape to it and all it does is connect a top aileron to the bottom aileron. It has a little footstep here to get into the cockpit. Now one of the things I wanted to show you about the cockpit, which I really do not like on this airplane, is how they cut the canopy when they built it. Now from what I'm told, they cut this part, you can see basically between here and here is pretty much a 90 degree angle. And they, they did that so it's, it's back more so that they could fly it without the aft canopy. But what that does, and I'm gonna compare it to my E-Model in just a second, but it has, especially with this antenna right here, you can only open the canopy so far. So it has a very narrow opening. And when you're wearing the parachute and trying to get in, or I imagine trying to get out, <laughs> it's very difficult to get in and out of the airplane. On the E-Model, you can see how they've angled that cut. And what that does, that adds a good three or four inches at the top here to the opening. And one of the smart things they did here too was put the comm antenna on the bottom of the airplane so that this canopy can slide all the way back. This airplane is actually fairly easy to get in and out of. I'll give you a tour of the cockpit in just a minute, but I wanna finish going around the outside. One of the other things that's different from the E-Model is the shape of the rudder. Now I've already taken the rudder off the E-Model to kind of show you, but just to, to tell you what I'm talking about, this area right here you can see is kind of flat. On the E-Model, it really, it comes around. It's, it's, it makes this whole area here almost a perfect circle. So it just adds a little bit more uh, rudder area to the, uh, the uh, E-Model rudder. And I think that's just a simple mod that some people do. I don't know if that's in the current plans, but uh, the rudder is shaped just a little bit differently. 
This airplane here does have a lot of clear access panels, which is nice. It makes for easy inspections. You can just shine a flashlight in there and see inside the airplane. Now both the D model and the E model both have tanks in the center section of the upper wing. This has a five gallon fuel tank that's plumbed to feed into the main 19 gallon tank. This airplane also differs a little bit in that you can see under the main tank here, it has a little two and a half gallon header tank. And I'm told the reason it has that header tank is because it eliminates the flop tube that's in the main tank. But I would assume there's still a small flop tube in this tank. I'm not sure exactly how that works. Now my E-model here does have a tank in the upper wing, but it was not plumbed to anything. It has these two lines coming from it. One of them comes down here and just ends at the firewall. And I think what they were going to do is use that for a smoke tank. Uh, they just never installed the smoke pump. The upper tank in my other airplane can be used as a smoke tank if I put a smoke pump in it, but you just have to uh, rework the plumbing a little bit. Now this airplane here, you can see it has that same 19 gallon fuel tank, but you'll notice it does not have that two and a half gallon header tank below it. It just has one flop tube in that tank to feed fuel when inverted. You can see the trim tab on the D model, which is much smaller than the trim tab on the E model. But remember, this airplane is a lot older than the E model also, so that's probably something I'm guessing the, uh, the designers changed. I will say though that this little trim tab is very effective in flight. It works very well with just a very small movement of the trim lever. Finally, the last big difference between the two is the tail wheel. This is the tail wheel on the D model. And now you can kind of compare it to the E model and you'll notice a couple differences. Just the tail spring is different. You can notice the size and type of wheel itself. And then also the D model has a locking tail wheel while the E model has a steerable tail wheel. There's a little lever in the cockpit, which I'll show you in a minute. But when it's slid forward, you can see how this locks a tail wheel, that little piece comes down and goes into a slot and locks it. So this is locked and this would be unlocked. As you can imagine from such a small little biplane, the cockpit is fairly small. Although I'm six foot one inch and I seem to fit fairly fine in here. You can take a look at the instrument panel. You can see it's pretty bare bones. It provides nothing more than what you need to fly the airplane. The throttle is on the left hand side. Below that we have the elevator trim. And then that little lever right there is for the locking tail wheel. It does have a radio. As you can see, this radio is quite old and this airplane is so freaking loud that the radio just doesn't work. Uh, if I'm anything above idle power, uh, I just, I can't hear anything on the radio and it won't transmit other than garbled nonsense because it's picking up so much cockpit noise. So I do have plans to replace that radio and maybe find a different headset that works in here. I've tried the Bose and the David Clark and neither of them seem to work well. As far as the seat goes, there really is no seat. It's just a piece of aluminum. And I actually found this one inch thick pad at Ikea <laughs> and I thought it would work perfect in there and it actually does. So there's not much to sit on. There is no backrest pad. Uh, the parachute acts as the best, the back rest pad. And then you can see the, uh, the buckle here. It has these quick release military style buckles. It has a ratchet so you can ratchet yourself in there really tight, which doesn't work at all because when you're sitting in here, the ratchet is down like this and it's completely unaccessible to ratchet. So you kind of have to adjust it before you get in and then try to buckle the buckles as you're sitting in there. It's quite difficult to do. Uh, there's a little fuel selector on the right hand side there. That's uh, what dumps the fuel from the top wing tank down into the main tank. Uh, so that's it. Pretty bare bones. But it's a lot of fun. All right, guys, hopefully that wasn't too boring and you enjoyed the look at this airplane. If you're unfamiliar with these type of aircraft, maybe you learned a little bit. I did go flying this morning because I'm trying to work on my loops and uh, well, I'll show you what I did this morning.
The last step before takeoff is to get the airplane lined up with the runway and lock that tailwheel. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm, I'm sliding that little lever forward. Sometimes it's kind of hard to engage that tailwheel. You can kind of feel when it goes in, but I always taxi forward slowly and kick the rudders just to make sure that it is locked. If it is locked, then we're all set and ready to go. Well, now it's just a short flight to get a little further away from the airport and gain some altitude to start practicing my loops. Now the first thing I'm doing before I get started is just doing some steep banks and pulling a little bit of G's just to get myself warmed up a little bit for the G loads. All right, that's enough screwing around. It's time to do the first loop. Now I'm only doing about 140 miles an hour. That's about as fast as this airplane will go in level flight. So I'm pulling back. I think you're supposed to get about three and a half to four G's. And I, I think I was only pulling about three. So I probably need to pull a little bit harder initially, but it's really hard to tell without, I think somebody on the ground or without the smoke system to see how round the loops are. This one here, I came in about 200 feet low on the recovery. Now this second loop I did actually came out really nice. I leveled off right at my starting altitude and I even got a little bump from the wake turbulence. And the third loop I did, I was about 100 feet low. So pretty inconsistent, but who cares, I'm just having fun. So I celebrated my loops with a victory roll. Well, I did a few more loops and rolls and then it was time to head back for a landing. Don't want to 
wanna sleep in Cause I got something to prove I gotta take what I hate and finally make a move I think of you and all the shit you don't do Well I'ma make hella sure that I don't become you I have no regrets, yeah I'll tie up my chest I'll never forget what it's like to be in debt Been stabbed in the back bed I'll show you what happens Pass me the mic and I'll show you with action I feel this pain, you already know money show i've got these things that i can't let go watch me turn this life into something that you can never own i feel this pain you already know turn that to games let my money show i've got these things that i can't let go watch me turn this life into something that you can never own Well, I hope you enjoyed that little flight. Keep in mind, I only have about seven or eight hours of pits time. Before I flew this airplane, I, I flew my cruiser down to Kokomo, Indiana, and I flew with Wild Aerobatics, and I got 2.8 hours in their two-seat model, and uh, all I did was focus on takeoffs and landings until where I got those down pretty well. And I felt confident enough at that time to come back and fly mine. So now I'm just doing aerobatics, simple aerobatics, loops and rolls, just for fun. Once I play around a little bit and get more comfortable in the airplane, I plan on going back to Kokomo and going through their actual aerobatics course. Well, that's it for now, guys. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. We'll see you on the next one.